Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. May is over and that means it's time to take a look at another batch of updates for some of your favorite emulators. As usual, I'll be focusing on the free-to-play public releases of a few emulators from more modern consoles and I'll just be sticking to what's happened over the month of May, so anything that's happened in June or is still in early access will have to wait for another video. I do want to point out that some of these emulators have seen a ton of progress throughout May, so I'm not going to mention every little bug fix, but there is always a chance that I'll miss something along the way. So if you notice that I left something important out of this video, feel free to leave a comment below so that it doesn't get missed. And as always, you'll find links to all of these emulators and their Patreon pages in the description, so you can check them out and support the developers behind them if you'd like. And if you're into this sort of thing, be sure to get subscribed to my channel to see monthly recaps like this, as well as all sorts of other emulation-related content. Jumping right in, the PlayStation 3 emulator RPCS3 saw a ton of updates in May, starting with some improvements to shaders, including some more work to the interpreter. As a result, users of AMD GPUs may see a slight increase in performance while using the interpreter, although this feature is still very experimental, so it's best to stick with the default asynchronous recompiler for now. Some of the biggest news in PlayStation 3 emulation in this last month was probably the new patches which were released for The Last of Us. You can check out my video covering this in a bit more detail, but these patches fix or bypass the vast majority of the graphical issues, while also improving performance quite a bit making this game run pretty well on high-end hardware. God of War 3 and Demon's Souls also got a bit of a performance boost from some FMA optimizations, although God of War still isn't playable quite yet due to some instability. Users of Ryzen CPUs and other processors that don't support TSX will also see improved performance in a handful of other games such as Red Dead Redemption, the Yakuza series, and Portal 2 thanks to some SPU and PPU optimizations that specifically benefit non-TSX performance. There were also some RSX improvements which fixed a few issues including the Grey Skies in Grand Theft Auto 5 and MLB The Show 14, as well as the Broken Water in One Piece Pirate Warriors. This update also fixed some color issues in games such as Yakuza 4 and the post-processing in Crisis. The Saints Row series and Red Faction Armageddon are also looking quite a bit better after an update which fixed some of the lighting and missing textures in these games. There was also a fix to Gran Turismo 6 which allows it to boot when there's save data present, bringing this game one step closer to being playable, although there are still a few unpreventable crashes along with some general instability. Looking at some remastered PS2 titles, Shadows and Sly 2 and 3 have been fixed by implementing partial stencil buffer clears in the Vulcan backend, and Metal Gear Solid 2 got a fix for its opaque water after stippled rendering was implemented. This may have affected other games as well, although they're also likely to be from the PS2 era, as this rendering technique was primarily used in older titles. Speaking of the PS2, version 1.6 of the PlayStation 2 emulator PCSX2 has finally been released after much anticipation. As for what's changed, it really depends on where you last left off with this emulator. This is more or less just a stable release of version 1.5, so if you've been keeping up with the development builds, then you won't really find anything new here. However, if you haven't checked it out since version 1.4, then there's more changes than I could hope to cram into this video. You'll find a detailed change log in the description, so check that out if you want to see exactly what progress has been made in the years between versions 1.4 and 1.6. One of the biggest benefits to this release is that it lifts the feature freeze that's been in place on this emulator for quite some time, and the developers have wasted no time pushing changes into version 1.7. We've already seen a few updates to this new development build, such as a fix for the Blue Flames in Klonoa 2, and the Shadows in Ridge Racer 5. Performance has also been improved in both Primal and Ghost Hunter, and while using Proffle's plugins, which you can find in the description, you can play Primal in hardware mode, allowing this game to look better than ever. Dithering has also been added to hardware mode, so if you're into that, you can toggle it with the page down key or in the gsdx.ini file. There was also an update which allows the Emotion Engine recompiler to work with more than 32 megabytes of RAM, which opens the doors to emulating dev kits and other PS2-based hardware with more RAM than the retail console. One of the biggest changes in 1.7 is that Windows 7 is no longer supported, and as such, the developers have started to remove features specific to that operating system such as X-Audio 2.7. 
While this is unfortunate for Windows 7 users, it makes development for this emulator quite a bit easier. Plus, Microsoft is no longer supporting this operating system either, so it's a good idea for people to upgrade anyway. Next up, you guys have been asking for it, so I want to give a quick rundown of what's been going on with the PS Vita emulator Vita 3K. Although this emulator still isn't running many commercial titles, the developers have been making quite a bit of progress. In the last month, Vita 3K got support for PKG files, as well as no NP DRM dumps. There's still no support for vitamin dumps, but this is a pretty big step for this emulator, as previously applications could only be run if they were in the ZIP or VPK format. There was also an update which added PVRT texture support, allowing some games like Run Sackboy Run and Salt and Sanctuary to render their intros a bit better, although both games get stuck at that point for now. An update to how this emulator handles texture swizzling has fixed a few things such as the character select screen in Asterisk War Phoenix Festa, and it's allowed the loading screens for God of War 1 and 2 to render in the God of War collection, although neither game is running just yet. New Game Challenge Stage and Persona 4 Golden are also getting a bit further in-game, but if you want to play Persona 4, it's still recommended that you use the custom build which you can find in the description. Again, the simulator can't run many commercial games yet, but the homebrew puzzle game Flood It has been made playable this month after an update which fixed an unhandled relocation code. The simulator also got a couple of updates to the UI such as a grid view for your games and apps, a button to load the last app that was used, and support for themes. Things have really been heating up for Xbox emulation over this last month thanks to some great progress from the CXBX Reloaded team. Early May saw quite a bit of work involving shaders, as well as the implementation of MSAA, or multi-sample anti-aliasing. In addition to reducing jagged lines and smoothing out how games look on this emulator, these updates also fixed an issue with offset models in a ton of games, particularly those running on the renderware engines such as the Grand Theft Auto series, Kill Switch, Sonic Heroes, and many more. It also fixed a few menus that were invisible or improperly scaled like in Dead or Alive 2. While most games affected still have issues with stability, these updates have allowed a few games such as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and MX2002 featuring Ricky Carmichael to become playable, despite some minor graphical issues. A few other games such as Shadow of Destiny and Dead to Rights have also been confirmed to be playable in the last month and some more audio fixes have WWE Raw getting in-game consistently, although only the HUD is rendering correctly. We also got a formal announcement for the upcoming Xbox Live substitute Insignia, which is also being developed by CXBX Reloaded's lead developer Luke Usher. You can expect full compatibility between Insignia and CXBX Reloaded, as well as stock and modded consoles, but it's still a work in progress and should hopefully be available for public use later this year. In the meantime, there's another major graphical update in the works, so hopefully we'll see some more big improvements to CXBX Reloaded in the next month or so. Moving along to Xbox 360 emulation, development on Xenia seems to have slowed down a bit, but there were still some very notable improvements throughout the month of May. Most of the work done this month was focused on GPU emulation, and as a result, a regression was fixed which was causing some of the device lost errors which plague NVIDIA users, although they're still not gone entirely. There was also an update which allows certain EA games such as the FIFA series to create save files. However, there is still a bug which will cause the first save attempt to fail, and most, if not all of these games will still crash when loading into a match. As mentioned in my previous recap, there's a lot of work that needs to go into merging some of the recent changes to Xenia into the Canary build. The developers have been plugging away at this over the last couple of months, and a new, slightly cleaner version of Xenia Canary has been taking shape. You can check out this new Canary branch on GitHub, and while it does still support Unreal Engine games, it is a work in progress, so some of Canary's unique features are still missing. In the meantime, there was an update on the 1st of June which allows Unreal Engine games to run on the master build in a cleaner fashion than the hack that's implemented in the Canary build. While this gives many users less incentive to use the Canary build, it's still great to see this version of Xenia being supported as it's a great testing platform and there's some features exclusive to Canary that are quite useful, such as support for multiple profiles. Nintendo Switch emulation has been moving along as steadily as ever, and Ryujinx has seen its fair share of progress over the last month. 
For starters, both Splatoon 2 and Super Mario Odyssey got quite a bit of a performance boost from an update which allows for more efficient queries between the GPU and CPU. Ryujinx also got some fixes to culling which addressed some of the biggest graphical bugs in a few games such as Disgaea 4 and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Although Xenoblade is still quite unstable, so unfortunately, it's not playable just yet. Speaking of Xenoblade, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition has been in-game since release, although unfortunately there are still some bugs that make it fairly unplayable in its current state. Shantae and the Seven Sirens is another game that was playable on release, and it seems to be running with only a few minor graphical glitches, granted it's not the most demanding title to hit the Switch. Along with these new releases, some new instructions implemented in this emulator have brought a few games such as World of Final Fantasy Maxima in-game for the first time. May also saw the addition of support for multiple controllers in this emulator, allowing for local multiplayer, which is a must-have for games like Smash. On top of all of this, there was also the addition of a new physical memory manager, as well as plenty of other bug fixes that have this emulator set up for more progress in the future. As we keep moving along, I just want to mention again that I'll be focusing on the free mainline versions of both Yuzu and Simu. The early access versions of both have seen more updates than what's covered here, but I want to focus on what's currently available for everyone. Unfortunately, multi-core CPU emulation still hasn't made its way to the mainline version yet, as there are still a few things that need to be ironed out before it's ready to be merged. That said, there were still plenty of great updates to Yuzu throughout May, such as another performance improvement to Pokemon Sword and Shield in some cities and routes. Animal Crossing New Horizons also saw some more progress in May, with a fix for terrain while using Vulcan, as well as a fix for an issue with saving. Yuzu also had viewport swizzles implemented last month, which resolved the upside-down menus in games such as Celeste and Axiom Verge the latter of which is now rendering much better, although it's still running a bit slow. There were also fixes for some crashes while using the Vulcan backend with asynchronous GPU emulation, as well as the addition of assembly program code paths which allow shaders to build faster in OpenGL. In addition to these improvements, a few more titles are booting for the first time on Yuzu. For example, Torchlight 2 is now working after a few missing audio services were implemented last month. Bulletstorm is also now booting on this emulator, and it's running pretty well despite some graphical issues as you can see here. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is also looking much better on current builds of Yuzu after a few updates that were focused on this game. Some of these improvements were merged into the mainline build in June, so I'll cover them in a bit more detail in my next recap, but this game has had a major facelift over the last month or so. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is also looking great, but performance is still a bit rough in these games without multi-core CPU emulation, so hopefully we'll see that feature get merged into the mainline version soon. Jumping back a generation to Wii U emulation, Simu saw quite a few changes over the month of May. An experimental SPIRV optimization pass has been applied to shaders which are compiled during the loading screen. This means that some stuttering will be reduced as pipeline objects will now compile in-game much quicker than before. This does have the effect of causing games to take a bit longer to boot, but an SPIRV cache was added so that this pass only has to be done one time per shader rather than to every shader every time that you boot the game. And of course, there was also the addition of asynchronous shader compilation in the last month. This only works with Vulkan, and it's considered experimental, so you'll need to enable this setting in the experimental section of the debug tab, and you'll also need to install the optional Vulkan drivers for your GPU, which can be found in the description. It's worth mentioning that this implementation is considered to be a bit hacky, so the Simu team is working on some updates which will help reduce shader-related stutter in a cleaner fashion. In addition to this, Simu received a few more Vulkan-related updates throughout May including some fixes for vertex explosions that could happen in any game, particularly on GPUs with lower amounts of VRAM. Some of the lighting in Mario Kart 8 and Splatoon has also been fixed, as have the overly bright backgrounds in some levels of Smash while using the Vulcan backend. On top of all of these changes, there were also some quality of life updates such as some cleanup to the UI, and the addition of a title manager which will highlight any errors with your games, DLC, and updates, and allow you to fix them from within the interface. Also, when you update your graphics packs, Simu will now let you know if any previously enabled graphics packs have been removed or renamed. 
And rounding things off this time, we have the Nintendo 3DS emulator Citra. The biggest news here is that the Android version of Citra was officially released in May, and although it's still an early access app, you can find it on the App Store through the link in the description. Unfortunately, I don't have a way to capture footage from my phone without absolutely tanking performance, but just keep in mind that this is a pretty demanding emulator for mobile devices, so it's recommended that you have a device that's equipped with at least a Snapdragon 835 CPU. There have already been a few updates to things like input in the Android version. For example, you can now configure whether the virtual joystick recenters itself or not, and the touchscreen is now functional while pressing the virtual face buttons. The D-pad also got some fixes so that it's not activated so easily, and you can also now slide your finger across it to change direction. Support has also been added for decrypted CIA files, which can be installed directly through the UI. Although just keep in mind that there's no loading bar yet, so it may seem like the app is frozen during installation. More devices such as Nvidia Shield TVs are also now supported thanks to some updates which work around a few bugs and features that are not supported on Tegra devices at this time. Even with all of this focus on the Android version of Citra, the PC version also saw some progress in May, such as some optimizations to the graphics backend, as well as improvements to microphone input. There was also an update which fixed an issue with saving in Detective Pikachu, as well as some quality of life changes such as the addition of dead zone controls and the ability to access files located on a network share. Citra also received an update to core timing accuracy, which may cause some minor performance regressions in some games, but it's helped set this emulator up for more accurate emulation in the future. So that's just about every major update to these emulators from the month of May. Again, if you notice that I missed something important, feel free to leave a comment below so that it doesn't get left out. We've already seen some really cool updates from some of these emulators in June, so be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.